Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. We're learning more about what Republicans are basing their case on as they try to challenge Michigan's election results. Paula? COVID cases are on the rise in Michigan. Why the governor says she believes this could be the most dangerous time of the year and what you can do to make sure that it's not. Another school district and another city hall forced to make changes due to COVID as the state sees another big jump in cases. It seems every two or three days we're reporting a new record number of COVID cases in Michigan. Yeah, we're on a, a bad trajectory at the moment. Here's the latest. The state reporting 6,473 new cases, the highest single day number yet. Tragically, it comes with 84 additional deaths, 25 of which were discovered in a review of past vital records. The Clarkston Community School District is the latest to shift to remote learning. The district says it has 35 positive cases and hundreds of staff and students in quarantine. The city of Farmington has decided to close its city hall to the public effective Thursday due to a significant spike in local COVID cases. They will, however, allow appointments if they are absolutely necessary, but you must call first. Let's assert the turn now to decision 2020. Michigan's election results continue to be challenged. Last night, Republican Party chair and Michigan native Ronna McDaniel saying they plan to fight it all out in court. And we know their case is centered around the counting of absentee ballots at the TCF Center last week. But what's the nature of the claims? Who and where are they coming from? Grant Herms has a closer look. The fight over the election still alive in Michigan. State and national Republicans claiming this week they have hundreds of sworn statements alleging irregularities and illegal activity at Detroit's TCF Center. Now we have a whistleblower and now we have a 30, 131 affidavits talking about irregularities and problems that were happening in Detroit. That's just Michigan. Among the claims are those that have been debunked or already thrown out in court. Like poll workers were told to backdate ballots, that was considered hearsay in the court of claims. That workers were allowed to wear shirts supporting Biden, which is illegal. And the now disproven theory that a software error in Antrim County could have caused a statewide voting problem. According to a spokesperson for the state Republican Party, some of those claims have come from the party's tip line asking for stories of wrongdoing. If you're calling to report an incident, Leave your name, your phone number, what the incident is, and someone will get back to you. The hotline was set up after the election and does not tell callers to notify law enforcement. Also on Tuesday, reporting suggesting Southfield native and GOP chair Ronna McDaniel may be in danger of losing her job. CNN reporting the president's son, Don Jr., is working to oust McDaniel, saying she hasn't done enough to win the election and potentially setting up a 2024 run for the president's re-election. And today, Democrats saying they want to be a part of the Trump campaign lawsuit here in Michigan. They want to step in on the side of Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. They initially tried to be a part of that claim before it was denied by a judge. And they say now that the Trump campaign is appealing, they want to, too. Meaning a national fight between Democrats and Republicans will play out on a Michigan stage. In Detroit, Grant Herms, Local 4. All right, Grant and the Republican Party says many of those sworn stories of alleged election problems have been sent to the U.S. attorney for further review. Now, as uh, President Trump's team continues its rather extraordinary efforts to challenge the election results, President-elect Joe Biden says he's on track to hit the ground running even without the help of the federal government. Trump administration today putting up more roadblocks to the normal transition of power we've uh, become accustomed to. NBC News has learned Biden is not receiving the daily intelligence briefing traditionally given to an incoming president. President Trump again on Twitter making baseless allegations of widespread fraud. The nation's top diplomat even making this remark. There will be a smooth transition to a second Trump administration. Meantime, the director of the election crimes branch quit immediately after the attorney general, William Barr, authorized federal prosecutors to investigate if they find substantial allegations of fraud. Now, some uh, familiar faces in Michigan have been named in the Biden-Harris agency review team, which will be tasked with evaluating the operations of federal agencies so the new administration knows where those agencies stand. Former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, recently with the University of Michigan, has volunteered to help review the Department of Justice. 
and the current head of Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services, Robert Gordon, will serve as a team lead for reviewing the national DHS. Uh, Na Detroit native Carrie Duggan is going to be part of the Department of Energy team, and we know of at least four other team members with Michigan connections, mostly though through universities and the ACLU. Meanwhile, Governor Whitmer answered questions about COVID today, and a lot of it focused on the holidays. She shared how her Thanksgiving is going to be different and what she hopes others will do. Paula Tutman takes us through the changing holiday recommendations. Michigan's numbers are on the rise, and the wave is looking more like a tsunami in terms of infection rates, according to Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Already, 6,400 cases are reported in the state today, which includes 84 deaths. As scary as the spring was, these numbers are, are worse than what we were seeing in the spring, and we are seeing our hospitals start to fill up. Her biggest concern is Thanksgiving, a time of gathering that could prove costly in terms of the state's ability to fight the disease. But as we get ready for the holidays, every one of us is going to have to have a plan and think long and hard about how we keep our families safe. And I know it's hard. No one loves Thanksgiving more than I do. Um, and I love to host and have the whole family come together. We're not going to do it this year because it's just too dangerous. And what are your plans for Thanksgiving? You're urging others to be circumspect in what they do. Let us know what you're going to do as well, please. My Thanksgiving plans, usually I host. I love to cook. I love to bring the whole family together. Uh, my sister, who is my, we are very close. She's going to stay in New York with her family. We're going to do a Zoom call and cook together. Uh, we'll watch the lions. I think it's important to reiterate, if there's more than one household in an enclosed space without ventilation, meaning windows open, for any period of time, it's just inherently dangerous. If it's more than two households, it grow, it, the danger increases exponentially. And that's why we encourage people to really think that way as you make your plans for the holidays. And in fact, the governor is actually soliciting ideas from other people on how they plan to stay physically distant while still being together. She says some of the best suggestions will actually end up on the official website. Paula Tutman, Local 4. All right, Paula, and are you having a hard time making the decision about what to do for Thanksgiving? Well, we're giving everybody a gut check on how to make that difficult call. That's tomorrow on Local 4 News Today. Yesterday's hopeful announcement of a 90% effective vaccine from Pfizer, only the beginning of a much longer process to actually begin vaccinating the American public. We've been keeping him busy. We're talking about Dr. <laughs> yeah. Frank McGeorge. He is here with a look at uh, some of the challenges ahead. Frank. Yeah, Kim and Devin. So although the Pfizer vaccine isn't officially authorized for distribution, preparations are already underway across America to get it into people's arms. That's because this is a new type of vaccine that is much more complicated, requiring extra planning and thought. It's a massive logistical challenge. How to move hundreds of millions of doses of a COVID vaccine to Americans across the country. Pfizer's vaccine must be kept at 70 degrees below zero Celsius. While it waits to submit the vaccine for emergency FDA approval, the company is already setting up a deep cold storage supply chain using suitcase-sized cooling boxes to ship critical supplies to doctors and hospitals nationwide. Once they take it out of the ice, they can keep it five days in the normal fridge. So we have worked extensively to develop this distribution network. Pfizer says it will ship doses from its facilities in Michigan and Wisconsin. With each person needing two shots, the company expects to have enough for 25 million people worldwide this year. Now, a U.S. advisory panel has already laid out who could get priority in receiving a vaccine, starting with frontline doctors, nurses, first responders, and nursing home workers, then people of all ages with two or more risk factors. The next phase would include teachers, school staff, child care workers, and people working in the food supply chain. Phase three would include children and young adults 30 and younger. Phase four would include everyone else living in the U.S. Now keep in mind that the Pfizer vaccine is only one of potentially several that will hopefully become available in the future. Each one of them will have their own supply chain requirements, which is why the military is managing the vaccine distribution, a task that would ordinarily fall to the CDC. Back to you. Okay, Doc, we appreciate it.
United States Supreme Court today heard a challenge to the Affordable Care Act, more commonly known as Obamacare. Opponents of the law say when it was passed, it was a tax law. But when Congress removed a tax penalty in 2017, they said the remaining law became unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts and Trump appointee Brett Kavanaugh appeared in today's arguments to suggest the law could stay in place as is. Their votes, along with three liberal justices, would keep Obamacare as American law, a decision, though, not expected till next spring. All right, time now for a local 4 News update. Paul Whelan says he is optimistic both the Russian and American governments will work out a deal to release him from prison. You may remember the Novi man was convicted in June of spying in Moscow. He told ABC News, quote, I don't think I'll be here that long. The governments will work it out quickly. I think it's a bit of an embarrassment for the Russian government because they've by now figured out they've made a mistake, end quote. The Michigan court sentenced the American security executive to 16 years in prison. Whelan insists he is innocent. The COVID pandemic has had a big effect on the legal system. We've often seen judges holding hearings via Zoom, and some courthouses have had to shut down due to outbreaks. But something they're trying in Ann Arbor might help ensure justice can continue to be done in a timely manner. Larry Spruill shows us how arraignments are going mobile. Your phone can really be used for anything nowadays to look up information on the Internet to keeping in contact with your family. And now one local police department is using mobile technology to bring the courtroom to those who need it. It's an innovative idea. Uh, kind of started with a couple of our officers in a, an in, in, informal uh, conversation with the magistrate. You know that the pandemic had hit the uh, a lot of the courts um, facilities were closed to the public and things like that. And Lieutenant Mike Schwerber with Ann Arbor Police says the idea took off from there. What started out as a, an idea with a couple of you know downtown officers um, began to get some momentum and an idea was developed that hey what if we did a, a mobile arraignment. So here's how it works. Officers will identify those individuals who have active warrants within the 15th District Court and meet them in public. They will then contact the judge either on the phone or iPad. Minor warrants like open intoxication, disorderly conduct, things like maybe trespass, things like that. No, you know, crimes against persons, any kind of violence that would not qualify for this program at all. What started out as an officer with a cell phone, um, the department has now provided um, the officer with an iPad. Um, and as well as a printer. So now the officer can get the arraignment done of the in individual and then right there at a public location, actually print out the paperwork to say, here's your next court date. Make sure you make sure you come. Ann Arbor police say this program just started and so far they arraigned about 10 people. They're expecting a whole lot more. Larry Spruill, Local 4. All right, Larry and Ann Arbor police say if you have a minor warrant in that area, you can contact the police department and they can take care of things right then and there. The countdown to more November like weather is on. That's right. Hi there, Ben. Yeah, that's been the talk, the temperatures. But leading up to that, we've got thunderstorms. In fact, parts of the state could be looking at severe storms tonight. We'll time out what that means for us coming up. So the city of Birmingham is going through a lot of flux. People have their own opinions, so uh, that's their opinion, and I respect them. And so the question was, who do they want to have for mayor? And the thing is, the mayor himself decided the race. 